Which Catan character is the best in a game of Warhammer 40k? In this video we're going to be comparing the four Catan characters, we're going to be going through their offense, their defense, as well as their in-game capabilities and abilities and things like that. We're also going to be revealing the results of the poll where you guys actually voted what's your best Catan character. And at the end of the video I'm going to be ranking my top four Catan characters. So let's get into it, but first roll the intro. So with the full Catan, you've got the Nightbringer. The Nightbringer, he is an absolute animal in melee, as you guys may or may not know already. You've got the Void Dragon, who's an absolute nightmare in general, but especially against vehicles. You've got the Deceiver, the Master of Tricks, as well as the Transcendent Catan. Now the Transcendent Catan is slightly different from the other three, because the other three are actually epic heroes. So you can only have one of them, they are named. The Transcendent Catan isn't named, so you can actually take three of them in your list if you wish to. So let's get into the shared abilities to begin, before we start pulling them apart. The first is the Necrodermis ability, so they half all damage, rounding up, don't forget. They've also all got the 5 plus feel no pain save, so for the after save, which is a third of the dice, or the third of the wounds or damage, it gets ignored, which is nice. They've all got the same statistics, mainly we're looking here at the toughness 11 with a 4 plus in vulnerable save and 12 wounds. And the OC, they've all got 4 OC except for the Deceiver which is kind of strange. The Deceiver has an OC value of 6. Some people do forget that. So, so far everything is pretty balanced. Now let's check out the differences and then let's start in fact with the offense, the offensive side of these four Catan characters. Now we're going to break this in even further, we're going to look at it at range to begin. When you're talking about range and you're talking about the Nightbringer, you look towards the Gaze of Death. Only 18 inch range but this guy wants to get into a fight, he is not bothered about the range whatsoever, he wants to get nice and close and personal anyway. Only D3 attacks but he hits on 2, strength 12, minus 2 OP, D6, plus 3 damage. So that's pretty nasty for something that's supposed to be good in melee. So before he even makes his charge, he's doing a, a fair amount of damage against virtually anything realistically. If he's able to do a max damage there of 9 per attack or per shot, that's an absolute bonus before yeah, he's even got into a fight. The Void Dragon, well the Void Dragon's got a couple of weapon profiles here as well as an ability. So we need to discuss all three of them at this point now. Spear of the Void Dragon, it's only one shot. It hits on 2, strength 4, minus 3 AP, D6 plus 2 damage. Now you're looking at the strength 4 and you're thinking that's a bit stinky, right? But it's got the anti-vehicle 2 plus, so anything that's a 2 or more will become a critical wound roll. So it will effectively become a 6, if you look at it that way, to simplify the game. So it doesn't matter if it's strength 4 and going up against toughness 14. If you just roll a 2 plus against a vehicle, it's as good as a 6. So then you're getting into your minus 3 AP, D6 plus 2 damage with a single shot. He's also got the Voltaic Storm, this is more your anti-infantry weapon, it's got blast and sustain hits too, so plenty of shots there. 18 inch range, so slightly more there, a little bit better, D6 plus 3 attack, so a potential of 9, but as a minimum you're going to get 4, but then you've got blast as well, don't forget. Hitting on 2, strength 7 is all you really need, you're going to be wounded on 3s, potentially 2s against the smaller stuff, although I don't think the smaller stuff is the correct target. Minus 1 AP is okay, and damage 2 is nice. Now the ability, matter absorption. In the shooting phase, you're selecting one vehicle unit, which is his ideal target realistically, especially with the Spear of the Void Dragon. Within 12 inches, which is the same, in fact, as the Spear of the Void Dragon's range, with the same enemy unit. On a 2+, plus, that enemy vehicle suffers D3 mortal wounds, and the Void Dragon actually regains D3 mortal wounds. So not only are we regaining wounds from our command phase with reanimation protocols, you've then got D3 wounds coming from this ability, if you can get it within 12 inches of a vehicle, and roll a 2+. plus. The Deceiver, which is the third katana of this list today, you've got the Cosmic Insanity. Cosmic Insanity is very unique in fact, a lot of people underestimate the power of this weapon. It's got anti-character 4+, so if you fire at a character, it doesn't matter what the toughness is, on a 4+, you are making this a critical wound roll. And why is that so important? Well, it's important because you've got a devastating wound, so it become a dev wound as well. No armor save, no in run save. It's also got precision, of course, so you will be firing at a character unit. So if you've got a little space marine captain hidden among some, you know, a standard space marine unit, maybe incessors or eradicators, whatever, you can pinpoint the character out with anti-character 4 plus and precision with the dev wounds. It's 18 inch range, which is okay, six shots with it. 
Hit on two, strength six, minus two AP, one damage. So when you've got six shots hit on two, that's five on average are going to hit. And then any four plus rolls will become devastating wounds, which will go straight through armor, straight through inbound saves. So you're looking on average to sort of th two or three, but against a low level character, that's pretty good. Don't forget it is strength six as well. So even if it's not a character, or even if you are going up against a character that is only toughness four, for example, you can still wound on a three plus. It won't become a devastating wound, but it will still it will still wound on a three plus. And then the final katan of this list in terms of offense at range, we've got the transcendent katan with the seismic assault ability. Assault is one of the keywords, which is actually quite important because of the teleporting ability. We will talk about that later on in this video. And sustain hits one, which is nice. 12 inch range, it's all you really need, especially if you use that teleport ability. Six shots hitting on twos. This time it's a little bit better than the Deceiver, although it doesn't have the, you know, the character killing capability. It's strength eight, minus two AP and D3 damage each time. That sustain hits one for me personally, always gets me my hit back. You will roll a one in there on average, but you'll also roll a six in there on average. So you pretty much get six hits going through as an average. And yeah, if you're strength eight, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Now all four weapons are very different and they're going to be attacking different units in the game. So it's, it's quite difficult to compare them all, especially something like the Void Dragon, Spear of the Void Dragon against vehicles alongside the Deceiver, which goes up against characters. It's quite difficult to compare them. Some of them anti-tank, some of them anti-infantry and so on. But if I had to pick one of them, I had to pick one as a custom build for a Katan that I wanted then I would look no further than the Void Dragon. I think the Void Dragon is the best in terms of flexibility because it can go after the tank options, the vehicle options, but it can also go up against infantry options as well with a Voltaic Storm. It also throws mortal wounds as well as healing wounds back in the shooting phase. So I think my go-to at range would be the Void Dragon. Now onto the melee side of the offense. Let's go back to that Nightbringer again. The Nightbringer has got two profiles and an ability to discuss. It's the same weapon, but you've got a strike profile and a sweep profile. The strike profile has devastating wounds, which is nice. Absolutely brutal if it can get in. Don't forget, these Katan do go quite slow nowadays with six inches of movement. But hitting on twos, strength 14. And by the time you get onto the wounding stage, maybe you roll one devastating wound. Maybe. Maybe. It's all about the strength 14 though. Going to be wounded on threes probably. Against the smaller stuff it'll be twos. So maybe twos and twos. Minus four AP. So if they've not got any one save it's going to hurt. And D6 plus two damage of course is lovely. Now if you get swamped with a lot of infantry. A lot of little horde kind of units. You've got the sweet profile. There's no dev wounds here though. It's still strength eight. So even the small bugs and stuff. It's probably overkill for them to be honest with you. Kind of deals with space marines realistically. Because you're wounded on twos because the strength eight. Minus two AP puts them on a five plus armor save. And two damage pop removes models. So he's got the flexibility. Whatever comes at him he can deal with. But not only that. He's got the drain life ability. That drain life ability at the end of the phase. So at the end. If he's still alive of course. Roll one D6 for each enemy unit within six. So each enemy unit doesn't have to be the one. There could be more. And they might not necessarily even be in the fight. They just got to be within six inches. On a four plus, the enemy unit suffers D3 mortal wounds. So if you get them into a nice chunk of models that are all within six inches, it could be three or four units if you're really lucky. You've got half a chance of throwing out D3 mortal wounds on top of all the damage he's just done. The Void Dragon, he has got two weapons, although one of them is there's two profiles. Again, another strike and sweep profile. Spear of the Void Dragon again, so it's the same as the range attack, anti-vehicle 2 plus again. That's pretty good even against non-vehicles. You're still strength 12, you're still doing a lot of work with that. I mean if you compare that to the Nightbringer, it's one less attack, two less strength, one less AP and the damage is the same. So it's not that far behind to be honest with you. But if you're going up against a vehicle, then yeah, it's, it's just a 2 plus. So yeah, hitting on 2s, wounded on 2s and then you're straight in, that's pretty good. Whereas the Nightbringer... Even though it's strength 14, if it was to go up against a vehicle that was toughness 13, it would still need to wound on threes. So it's slightly harder to wound potentially with the Nightbringer against certain units. He's then also got the sweep profile. It's 10 attacks, 2 damage. So again, slightly less in terms of stats than the Nightbringer, but a great flexible option. Further to this, he's got the Canoptic Tail Blades, which the Nightbringer, of course, doesn't have that. Extra attacks, so you will be using them. It's 6 attacks, hitting on twos. Strength 6, minus 1 AP, 1 damage. That's underestimated, I think. Strength 6, 
against the small, small stuff, you're wounded on twos. Against the intercessor kind of level stuff, you're wounded on threes. And then there's probably half a chance of them actually failing their armor save, because it's a four plus armor save at the end. Damage one, but it's extra attack, so you can't complain too much, really. In melee with the Deceiver, you've got the Golden Fists. The Golden Fists are actually they're reasonable, they're decent. You've got eight attacks there. That's another little stat that goes under the radar, a little bit like it's OC6. Hit on two, strength eight, minus three AP, and three damage a pop. So he could go Terminator hunting, without the shields, of course. If any of these goes through, it literally removes models. So that's decent. It is pretty good. And I think the Deceiver is just he's un, he's in an unfortunate position because the other three are more favourable, especially the Void Dragon because it's a newer model. But yeah, I don't think it's a bad weapon, the Golden Fist. And finally, you've got the Transcendent Katarn with the Crackling Tendrils, again sustain hits. One, eight attacks again. Hit on two, strength nine, minus three AP, and D6 damage. I think that's where it pushes the Deceiver out of the way a little bit because the stats are better. You've got, this, you've got the same attack, same weapon skill, better strength. Now you're going up against the big stuff. The light vehicles, maybe that are toughness 9. You can actually start to win them on a 4+. plus. You've also got sustain hits 1, don't forget. And the D6. The D6, I mean, as an average, you're going to get 3.5. Obviously, that you can't roll a 3.5. Whereas the Deceiver has 3 damage, so on average it's a 3 or a 4 for the Transcendent. Potential of a 6, potential of a 1. You will have those days where you roll Stinky and all the damage doesn't do much. You roll a 1 and a 2 and it's only done 3 damage, it's not great. Other days you roll a couple of 5s and you just slap 10 damage just like that. So it's a little bit more hit and miss. I think I prefer having a flat damage, but the Deceiver is slightly less in terms of averages than the Transcendent. Again, all four of these Katarns have got very different targets in the game for their range attacks as well as their melee attacks as we've done earlier. This one by far goes to the Nightbringer. Actually, no, it's not by far. The Void Dragon actually wasn't that far behind, to be fair, but I'm going to have to pick the Nightbringer. The, the, streep, the, streep, the Sweep and Strike profile, I think, make him so flexible for murdering enemy units. The Void Dragon does have those same profiles, the Sweep and the Strike profile. But the Nightbringer's numbers are just better in pretty much every stat there. Strength 14, there was an extra, extra attack, extra AP. I think the damage was the same, wasn't it? Let's just double check the damage. D6 plus 2. Yeah, the damage was the same, but to get there, it's much easier. I mean, if you're going up against monsters and vehicles, on average, the Nightbringer's doing 18 damage. And that's before all the mortal wounds at the end, which are on a 4+. Plus. And the sweep profile's killing about 10 Guardsmen, or 6 to 7 Intercessors, if you're keeping track of those figures. Anything bigger than Toughness 4, I would just use the Strike Profile. When you're looking at Terminates and things, there's no point doing the damage to. It's just throwing away dice there. So I would always use the Strike. Anything Toughness 5 and beyond. So what about the in-game uses for the Fork Tarns? I mean, we've already spoken about the melee side of it. We've also spoke about the shooting side of it. And we've spoke about two out of four Tarns in terms of their unique abilities. So there's still two others that we've not yet spoke about. Let's talk about the Deceivers to begin. We've got the Grand Illusion ability, so if your army includes this model, after you've done all your deployment and stuff, you can select up to three Necron units and you can effectively redeploy them. And you can even put them into strategic reserves if you wished. Now sometimes this ability does work wonders. I mean, if your opponent is really relying on seeing your deployment for their own firing lanes or to avoid certain things, hiding key units from our big stuff, then yeah, they want to see what your deployment does and then try and act or counteract what we are doing. But being able to move three or even put them in reserves is pretty cool. Maybe it unlocks a new firing lane for our faction. Maybe it's for the Locust Heavies. Maybe it's for the Doomsday Arcs to, to now find a new firing lane straight at their big bad targets. Maybe you've spotted a flank that isn't as guarded because they've tried to counteract something that we're doing. They've left one side open. All of a sudden we can change everything up, put everything on the other flank and away you go. It's also going to be quite useful for the Hyper Crypt to get even more units into reserves. Because if you've only got a maximum of three, potentially four actually with the enhancement in the Hyper Phase or Hyper Crypt Legion detachment, you can only pick up three units or four if you've got the enhancement as a maximum. But if you've stuffed three units into reserves, then you've got more units in reserves ready to go to pop out if you wished. In fact, before we move on, he's also got Stealth. That's something to add here. Stealth is quite key. Minus one to hit it at range. And then we come on to the Transcendent Katarn. Now we've got a couple of abilities here. First of all, we've got Deep Strike. He's the only Katarn that's got Deep Strike. Could be useful for a, 
for a second turn charge potentially. But also it's the transdimensional displacement ability, which I think is such a cool ability. Each time this model advances, instead of doing your normal advance move, you can take it off the battlefield and put it back on the battlefield anywhere you want as long as it's 9 inches away from any model. So it's effectively like an in turn deep strike. It could be used turn 1 and so on. You don't go into reserves or anything like that. You just pick him up, put him 9 inches away from enemy models. You can still shoot because even though you've been considered to have advanced, his weapon has the assault keyword, so you can still shoot as normal. Now why I like this ability so much is it's actually better than hyperphasing. Because with hyperphasing, you're going to be pulling off your units at the end of your opponent's turn. So in your command phase, those units are not on the battlefield. They're in reserves. They're in strategic reserves. Whereas the transcendent katan doesn't do its ability until the movement phase. So the command phase has already happened. What happens in the command phase? Victory points. You're scoring your primary objective points in the command phase. So if this katan is on an objective or contesting an objective alongside some other models maybe to gain an objective to maybe you're going to score, I don't know, five points or so on. It's very important for your primaries, of course. In the hyperphasing ability, you can't do that. You need to be off the battlefield. You're not scoring in your command phase. So that's the first reason why I like this ability so much. The second reason is for secondary scoring. Now, whether you're playing tactical, whether you're playing fixed, he works both ways. If you've got engaged in all fronts, he can do it. He can pop to the other side of the battlefield, secure one of the quarters that you don't have, maybe it's behind enemy lines, bang, jump to the other side of the battlefield, he's behind enemy lines, I mean you could go a bit further than that and start doing the action secondaries, I, don't, I wouldn't recommend it, but if you if you really needed it, deploy teleport home as cleanse and so on, he can do it, but you've got better options to do that. But yeah, as far as in-game abilities go, I think this ability with the transcendent katan is the best of the lot. I mean, there's only two here to compare. The other two are more to do with offense. Now, sticking with secondary objectives for a moment, in fact, let's bring the Nightbringer and the Void Dragon back into this discussion. We've already mentioned their abilities with the shooting phase and the fight phase, but they're both going to interact with secondaries such as, well, the current secondaries. Of course, the GT pack is going to change soon, but maybe we're talking about no prisoners, bring it down. They've got a lot of killing power, so they can do stuff like that. Storm hostile objective, overwhelming force to be killing units off the off an objective or just reducing their OC so that we can take over the objective. So they're going to have their uses for our secondaries as well. Now before revealing my top four in my particular order, I'm going to reveal what the community has voted on YouTube. So let me get this up. Let's have a look. Where is it? It is right here. So we've had 1,200 votes in two days, which is quite cool. So well done to you guys. You guys have voted 56% for the Nightbringer as your favourite. Second place goes to Void Dragon with 30%, Transcendent Katarn 11%, and The Deceiver got 3%. Not much love, unfortunately, for The Deceiver. So that's what you guys have voted. What about me? What am I doing? It's not going to be the same as you guys. I know that. But it, I mean, it all comes down to play style and preference at the end of the day. I don't think there is a correct order. I don't think there's a correct, you know, number one choice. It all comes down to what you like and what you do with it. So let's go down from the bottom. Number four, I do agree, it's the Deceiver. The Deceiver is an old model anyway, but we're not talking about the, the model itself. I think the other three are just better to field overall. I mean, the character assassination thing is kind of cool, but if you took like any of the other three, you could use the Epic, epic Challenge Stratagem for one CP and kind of do the same thing and absolutely murder a captain or an apothecary or whatever. So that's his sort of one party trick gone. The other party trick is, which is the um, Grand Illusion ability. Once you've done it, you've done it, and then the game has to play out. Sometimes it doesn't actually matter, and if your opponent knows you've got it, they're gonna, they're just gonna do their own thing and prepare a balanced deployment. So that's why the Deceiver is my number four. Number three, this one is, this one breaks my heart, you know, this one really breaks my heart and you guys actually voted this as number one, but I've gone with the Nightbringer. You guys know I love the Nightbringer, you know I do, but since the Codex, he has fallen in my opinion. He's fallen, his speed dropping to six inches of movement is a, is a huge deal, I know it's only an inch, but he, every inch counts in this game and you've got the slow slog fest up the battlefield, Maybe he gets into one or two fights per battle. And 
you've got to get your points back. If you're spending 200 and whatever he is, and I can't remember what his points are, is it 280, 290, something along those lines, whatever his points are, you've got to, as a minimum, get them back. If you're going up against, like, Astro Militarum, that's got all tanks, they're at the other end of the battlefield. Unless you're using strategic reserves and you're using, I don't know, rapid ingress or something, then you're not going to get there in time. And even if you do, that's probably going to be your only target for the rest of the game. Your opponent knows not to put anything anywhere near the Nightbringer, so they're going to avoid him like the plague. They all, Everybody knows the Nightbringer is an absolute beast. Probably one of the best in-game characters for killing anything that there is. So people know this. They're going to avoid it. They're going to be feeding it weak screens, putting things in the way. It does have fly, but fly is not as good as it used to be. You can quite easily screen out their better units from a charge. But yeah, going back to that rapid ingress a moment, if your opponent knows you've got him in strategic reserves and you're trying to use rapid ingress potentially, or just coming from the side of the, of the table edge, your opponent isn't going to put the good stuff at the sides. Simple as that. They're not going to put anything good at the sides. Make it more difficult for the Nightbringer to get to the juicy targets. You do have Cosmic Precision, which is for the Hypercrypt again. But if you're using that hyper, if you're using Cosmic Precision, you're three inches away, but you can't charge. You can't charge, so that's another turn. So you've not only you're not going to do anything turn one. If you're coming in with it turn two, potentially you're not charging turn two. You will be shooting with the Gaze of Death though. But he's a sitting duck as well. I mean, if he had Deep Strike, I think he'd be a, he'd be pretty good. But he's a sitting duck if you're using Cosmic Precision without a charge. So number three, unfortunately, the Nightbringer. Number one, well, number two and number one are very close for me. They're very close for me. For number two, I'm going with the Transcendent Katam. Now the problem with him, it's not an in-game problem, so this isn't really related to the video, but you can only buy the Transcendent Katan in the Tesseract Bolt or Nublis box, which is quite expensive. It's a hundred plus pounds in the UK. If you do get the Transcendent Katan out the box and use him as a as a Katan, okay, you get the Obelisk, which not many people use. It's not horrendous, the Obelisk, but that's another video for another day. If you're going to do the, tran the Tesseract Bolts, then the likelihood is you're going to glue him in. There's probably ways of magnetizing him in. Ideally, Games Workshop need to be selling this model individually, especially the fact that we can take three of them. Put them on the market, let us buy them individually. Don't know why they haven't done this yet. I mean, it performs reasonably re well at range and in melee. I think it's, it's obviously better in melee with the D6 damage rather than D3. The teleporting ability is where it gets its number two from, in my opinion. Very close to number one, in fact, because I use... I think I actually use the Transcendent more than I do the Void Dragon, you know, which kind of makes this ranking system a bit funny because I use the Transcendent more because I play... At the moment, I play Fixed. I play Fixed, and it's sort of a backup plan for my Fixed secondaries. But for the overall game, I think it's number two. For number one, it's obviously the Void Dragon. That's the only one left. An absolute solid all-rounder. Extra attacks in melee, goes up against vehicles, goes up against infantry. Very, you know, defensively very sound, just like the, all the others are as well. Matter absorption, absorption, to be able to regain damage back after reanimation protocols as well. I mean, potentially you can stick a, a reanimator next to him, and that would be three lots of D3 in a single turn, which could be mad. That's, that's, that's actually incredible, really, if you think about it. If you can get within 12 inches of a vehicle, that is. But yeah, he's doing everything. Defensive, offensive. So he's got to be no, the number one for me. Got to be number one. And there is actually another reason, a smaller reason why he's number one, which is he's got an 18 mil base. Now, I'm just looking at the Nightbringer for a moment. The, the Nightbringer's half the size. It's only a 40 mil base. The Deceiver, which I don't actually own, so I'm just going to check that. That's a 40 mil base. And the Transcendent Katarn is a 60 mil base. So the Void Dragon has got the big, it's a big base. So in some cases you can argue that's a problem when you're trying to do like your, I don't know, cosmic precision or you're trying to find space to get him on. But in other situations it's good. You've got a larger diameter to be using your range weapons and to be measuring your charge move from. Because you can now go three, you can obviously go 360 from any part of the base, any direction. You've got a larger base there. If you've got a smaller base, you've almost got to go a few extra inches with the Nightbringer if you want to change direction. So yeah, guys, that is my ranked Katarn characters, as well as your number one pick in terms of Katarn characters. 
And that is it from me today. So make sure you are dropping a subscription on your exits. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you in the next one.